Thank you for joining us. My family and I started Bring Change to Mind 10 years ago to end the stigma and discrimination surrounding mental illness. Our mission was simple, to start the conversation. We've worked to promote open conversation ever since. From depression to bipolar disorder to post-traumatic stress, mental illness affects one in four adults and one in five children. We simply need to talk about it, dispel ignorant, destructive myths, and create empathy. Too many people are afraid to seek help. Bring Change to Mind creates safe and stigma-free peer-to-peer high school clubs where students learn about mental health, to listen and support each other, and are given the tools for self-care and wellness. Over the coming weeks and months, students will be reintegrating with their peers and returning to campuses for the first time in 14 months. We can help them and ourselves by listening without judgment, by starting and continuing courageous, supportive conversations in our home and with our friends. Tonight's discussion is an opportunity to address how mental health intersects with other critical issues that face our society. You will hear authentic and candid conversations. Our goal is to show that everyone deals in one way or another with mental health because we're human. My family and I have learned that where there is conversation, there is hope. For being with us tonight, Thank you. Hi there. I'm Alan Stewart, co-founder of Pair of Thieves. And most days we're selling socks and underwear. So it really is an honor to be able to switch gears for a sec and focus on such a meaningful campaign with Bring Change to Mind for Mental Health Awareness Month. A few years back, friends of mine lost their son to suicide. And Paige was your typical, perfect 17-year-old with a great family and good grades and a loving group of friends. And yet somehow even he didn't feel like he could talk to anybody. And that must have been incredibly lonely. And out of sadness and honestly frustration and determination, we created these Never Alone Socks. And people dug them. We gave them out at high schools. We sold thousands online and donated the profits and started a ton of conversations around mental health. Nothing we can do can bring Paige back, and that feels horrible. But his family's hope is that their story can be the difference of at least one person getting the help they need way before it's too late. And that's why Pair of Thieves is really excited to be here and sponsor the conversation series. It's yet another step in erasing the stigma that we all have to be okay all the time. We don't, and we shouldn't. My hope is that the panel you're about to watch will inspire you to open up with somebody you care about, or even a stranger. So we all know that we are never, ever, ever alone. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Justin Baldoni, filmmaker, co-founder of Wayfair Studios, and author of my new book, Man Enough, Undefining My Masculinity, Shameless Plug. Uh, if you didn't know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and today we're here with Bring Change to Mind, a national organization working to end the stigma and discrimination surrounding mental illness to discuss men and mental health, two words that you don't often hear together. In other words, all the external limitations and the boundaries around masculinity, vulnerability, and how and when or even if we decide to talk about mental health and our internal feelings, and today... I am so happy to be joined by a group of men who are absolutely man enough to speak about their internal lives. So first of all, we have Emmy and Grammy and Tony Award winner, Billy Porter. What's up, my man? Hey, how are you? <laughs> so good to see you. We got uh, my dear friend, Matt McGorry, an actor, an activist, a feminist dedicated to racial justice and gender equity. And as an actor, you know him from his roles in Orange is the New Black and How to Get Away with Murder. And uh, you might have even seen him on the first season of our show, Man Enough, when we sat down and talked about our feelings. Matt, what's up, baby? Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And we have Solomon Thomas, defensive tackle for the Las Vegas Raiders and bring change to mind ambassador he's in las vegas but he's in ac what's up my man what's up justin thanks for having me on man 
Oh, I'm so happy you're here. And uh, last but not least, my friend Chase Stokes, who is uh, also a Bring Change to Mind ambassador and such a good guy. Chase, how are you, buddy? I'm doing all right, man. Thanks for having me. So happy you're here. Um, all right. Also, a uh, big shout out to uh, People for co-hosting this event and bringing us all together. Limited definitions of masculinity have created a shame in many of us men uh, when it comes to asking for help. Uh, I think this is something we've been raised with. It's, uh, it's a part of the man box and this patriarchal culture that we live in. So I want to know from anyone who wants to talk first, how has this shown up in your own lives uh, and in your own mental health? For me, it, you know, I've worked through, I've worked through a lot of it in my late thirties, early forties. Well, in my thirties, really, because I was bankrupt. Um, the world had presented a space for me where there was no other option for me but to ask for help, which I think sometimes that's how we learn when there is no other option. Uh, so I learned how to help to ask for, you know, for help in that way. Um, you know, I am married now recently, you know, it's been another layer of asking for help when you're in an intimate relationship, you know, when you're in a marriage, that's also the most vulnerable space that you can be in. And, um, you know, I've been learning how to be vulnerable with my partner so that we can um, have the best relationship possible. So, you know, I think there's an awareness. Once there's an awareness that there's an issue, um, one must just take a leap <laughs> and try it. You know, it's so it's such a habit. You know, it's such a bad habit. Billy, do you feel like there's a lot of unlearning you got to do yeah. in the process? Yeah. Like, so it's like, it's like in real time, you know, you might need to ask for help, but there's like this part of you that just goes, nope, can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. Do you feel like you're having a fight and like yeah. pull it out of you sometimes? Yeah, I, th I, I, I know um, but it's a fight. It feels very, very much like a fight sometimes. You know, I just had a, you know, a, a really complicated conversation with my husband today, you know, and I'm just so grateful that we can now, you know, we used to not be able to, you know, I think, um, well, I know for myself, you know, the quarantine and us just being together all day, every day, you know, I think it's like <laughs> for a lot of relationships, it was either like stink or swim. Take a swim. You're either going to Solomon, be or you're not. <laughs> Solomon, I see you. I see you nodding your head. Like you got some, you, you feel this a lot. What are you saying? Oh no, I just I just hear him saying with the relationship. Like it's 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 a lot when you're with your intimate partner for all day every day. Like it's new new levels of boundaries. New you have to learn to be a whole new whole new level of vulnerable. And so no, I I hear Billy what he's saying completely. But but like with my own journey with my mental health and me asking for help, I, similar with Billy. I got to a place where I didn't have a choice. Uh, I lost my sister to suicide in 2018. That's why I started to speak about mental health. That's why I started trying to raise the stigma against mental health. And I did that before addressing my own mental health. And as a man, as a football player, I thought I had to be tough for my mom and dad. I thought I'd be tough for everyone around me. And I thought that being tough was just me pushing through. Like, I'm okay. I'm straight. Like my whole life I've had to figure it figured out. Like I was a, a great player in high school, great player in college. Like I'm straight. Like, and then it got to a point where I kept suppressing, pushing down my emotions. My depression got real bad. I got to a place where it was harder to live than it was to not be here. And once I realized that, and once I was in a, that dark of a place, I was like, man, screw it. I need help. And then once I finally got up for help, it changed my life. And while doing all this, I was preaching to people, get help, be vulnerable. While myself, I wasn't doing that because of the stigma that I've been raised and the stigma that we live in as men. And so that's just my mission and my goal today is to teach men that, you know, to be a man isn't to be tough or to be strong, man. To be a man, I stole this from Obama, is to be a good human being. And then being vulnerable is true strength because we can go on every day and be like, I'm strong, I'm tough, I got it, like, I'm good. But that is easier 
than to be like, hey, no, I'm, I'm feeling sad today. No, I'm actually depressed. Like I can go to my girlfriend and we have that type of relationship where I can be like, baby, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm feeling really off today. I'm feeling sad or depressed. Like I need some extra love today and stuff like that. And, and that's how we, we communicate and encourage each other. So um, that's just what I'm trying to take my life and give it to other people so they can learn from that. So they don't have to go to that dark place because sometimes people don't come back from that dark place. That's the end of it. So I'm trying to make sure people know to get help is it's out there. I encourage you to do it. It's amazing. It can change your life. So that's just my, my story, mental health and my story of help. Mm, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing the place that you were in. It's a hard thing to acknowledge that you were advocating on behalf of mental health while also silently suffering. And uh, kudos to you for bringing that up. And Chase, my man, I know we actually had a text exchange not too long ago. Yeah. You're, yeah. Um, a, you know, about you even being in it. And I, I really appreciated that you had the strength to even kind of say, hey, man, I'd, you know, I'd love to talk sometime. And uh, that's something as men that we're not really trained to do. Right. So wh what are your wh what are your feelings around that? Because I think you're you're one of the youngest amongst us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I am. And it's you know, it's been a whirlwind of, of you know, I guess two years now in in my career. And uh, it feels like with every high that I've hit, there's been a drastic low. Uh, my grandmother, who was a major component of my life growing up, uh, my parents got divorced when I was really young. Uh, she passed away right as right as I had booked, you know, the show that I'm working on. And so it was this weird counterproductive experience where I didn't know how to process death, uh, nor did I feel like I had a space to process it because I was so scared of of the fear of failure with work. And so I just had this mentality of saying, I'm just going to work through it. I'm going to work through it. And then I was in a 10 year relationship that ended uh, while I was working as well. So that was another sort of drastic change. Um, and then as the show came out, we all went into quarantine and, and that changed everyone's life. And three days after the show released, my cousin had overdosed. And um, it's, it's, I kind of went through a very tumultuous period of time there. And then um, things, you, you know, the quarantine happened and we all had to experience what, what are we going to do? Looking internal versus externalizing everything. And then was fortunate to go back to work. Um, and I did it throughout the pandemic. And then I got back to LA as I was texting with Justin about, and uh, within the span of a week, um, six days, actually, I lost one of my closest friends to cancer. And then my uncle passed away two days ago from cancer as well. So with every high I've experienced in the short period of time in my career, it's been immediately balanced with something very intense. And I have hit serious lows through this and had questions of my sanity, um, been concerned with my stability. And I didn't know how to ask out. I, I didn't know how to reach out for help initially. And I ended up going into therapy. I, it was the best thing that I could have ever done for myself. Uh, and it's, it's an ongoing battle, I think, which is the most important thing for me to, to constantly remember is every day is going to be different. Don't try to pretend like you've got a grip on yourself because it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not feel okay sometimes. And, um, and, you know, it's, I just can't stress enough that it's, it's an ongoing journey and I'm, I'm glad now that I'm learning more because I did speak up and ask for help and the help that I've gotten through bring change to mind and people like you, Justin, and other people in my life who have stepped up has been, um, it's been life changing. So that's kind of my journey. Thank you for sharing that, man. I'm so sorry yeah. about your, Thank you. your family. Yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a, our personal, our personal chat after this, but, yeah. um, uh, admire your bravery and, you know, talking about it even publicly with this group of guys. I think it's yeah. really, it's a beautiful thing. Matt McGorry, you, um, you are such an example to me of somebody who is so fearlessly dedicated to, um, to working on oneself and taking that, taking that shame and pulling it out of that, like dimly dark lit basement of our hearts right and Please. exposing it to the sun get it out <laughs> um i want to ask you man it, are there do you think there's diagnoses um as men that 
you know, whether it's depression or bipolar disorder or whatever it is, do you think there are diagnoses that are more acceptable or okay for us men to talk about than others? Are there things that you think we as men struggle with that um, we're just embarrassed that we just will never be able to tell anybody? Um, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the question and I appreciate the affirmation. I just want to say, I appreciate everyone on a call bringing their vulnerable and authentic selves. It's really beautiful and it feels very nourishing. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think, right, like as men, like there's really only one emotion that we're allowed to express and that's anger. Um, and even for most of us, uh, we're not necessarily, right, there's a difference between expressing anger <laughs> and, uh, and, and naming it, right? And sort of the angry expulsion of emotion onto someone else versus saying, as I even said yesterday to someone in my life, you know, I'm feeling really angry right now. I think I need to pause this conversation. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's relatively, a relatively new thing that we're opening up the space to talk about all these different complex layers of emotions. Right? And something that I have struggled with for a long time um, is body image, right? Um, we know actually that, that uh, anorexia is um, the deadliest mental illness. Um, and actually, uh, it's less prevalent among men, but for men that do have it, they're actually more likely, more likely to be fatal because we're less likely to be talking about it and also to be diagnosed by it, uh, with it. Right. And so, uh, you know, for me, that had been a long struggle and, you know, our industry, obviously we, you know, it, we've normalized a lot of different things, right. In superhero movies, you see, you know, men being made fun of for their bellies or even in animated like children's movies, men being made fun of for their bellies in ways that we at least consciously know that we like shouldn't do about women now, Um, even though obviously the greater effects of it is still uh, more on women. Um, And I think for me, it's about part of it has been about understanding where the external and the internal is. Right. So, for example, disordered eating does not exist in a vacuum. Right. And part of my personal motto, um, that's also the motto of the social impact and creative company that I co-founded uh, with my friend J. Love Calderon is personal transformation towards collective liberation. Right. So I recognize that many of the things that I'm struggling with, and especially those with less privilege are struggling with, are created in a larger systems. Right. So, for example, anti-fatness, right, or fat phobia, um, my body images just don't spring up out of nowhere magically. <laughs> right. It's in a culture that hates that. And so even I have to recognize that, right, like body, like uh, eating disorders among uh, people in larger bodies is actually more common than people in smaller bodies. And it's half as likely to be diagnosed. And so for me, it's about both unlearning the internalized parts of it, recognizing where it comes from, and then also simultaneously working to dismantle those systems um, so that I can provide my healing for myself, but also for me, part of healing is being able to heal my community, heal the world, um, and heal people who are suffering from the same things and or multiple versions of that based on other marginalized identities. Thank you. I also uh, have struggled with body images, you know, which I dig into in the book a bit. We've had some good chats about it. Um, Billy, I, I got a question for you. How do you think that we as men can break out of the limited idea scope of masculinity that's kind of enforced on us at an early age. Cause you seem like you've broken free in so many ways. And just, to, I, just I just know being in your presence, I'm like, I feel freer. And I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on that. You know, I, once again, I can only speak of my own journey. And I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I, from the moment I could comprehend thought, my masculinity was in question. I just finished my book last week, by the way. So, you know, and I talk a lot about the messaging that we receive that people don't even really realize is messaging. You know, it's like, I was five years old. I was in kindergarten and I was going to a psychologist after kindergarten every Wednesday because my family sent me to a psychologist after kindergarten because for some reason, 
they were uncomfortable with my mannerisms. At five, it's like it, it is so ingrained. It is so, as we've, you know, systemic. It's so, the infrastructure is so, we don't even think about it. So it's like, there has to be these conversations so that an awareness can exist. You know, you can't change the thing until you name the thing. So it's personal, you know, and I think the more conversations that we have like this, the more people like us who sort of step forward and speak about it, you know, I just, I mean, being in show business, it's like, I spent the first 25 years of my career just trying to be masculine enough in somebody else's eyes so that I could eat. Just so I could eat. It's like I'm just walking down the street and I'm being called a faggot. I open up my mouth and speak in complete sentences and I'm called a faggot. Like I don't have to do anything but show up. And I am berated with that word. Before I even knew what it meant, I was being called that word. Before the people who were calling me it knew what it meant, I was that word. It's like, it's from the inside out. It has to start within. Whatever the change is has to start within. Be the change that you want to see. I finally looked at myself and was like, well, nobody believes that I'm masculine enough to work in a masculine role. That's clear. So why am I even bothering? Why am I even bothering? I'm sick of begging people to see me who have no intention of ever seeing me. So I'll see myself. I'll see myself. And myself is this. And this is what I'm going to present. And this is who I am. And if you don't like it, move. Just move out of the way. Just move out of the way. I'm not trying to put my, you know, I don't have an agenda other than my own mental health. Because y'all ain't going to drive me crazy. I've seen crazy. You know, I've seen it happen. You know, I've seen it overtake. I've seen, I've seen people's mental health just be shattered by outside forces and energies. You know, and so if there's one thing that I could say is like, how do we get internal? How do we start the healing process from the inside of ourselves? Because that's the only way it sticks. That's the only way it's real. It's for, in, in my experience, the only way that it ever got real was when I got real with myself and was like, I just can't do this no more. And I'm not. <laughs> wow. And I can't even, you know, and I can't even imagine, you know, cause I'm gay. So the assumption is when you're gay, that you're not masculine. That's the whole thing. So when I took the requirement of masculinity off of myself, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. And I'm healthier and I'm freer. And like everything opened up. Everything opened up in my life. You know, the very thing that everybody told me was my liability. My queerness is my liability. My femininity is my liability. You know, being in touch with that. The minute that I let all of those expectations go, my professional life exploded. And it was like, oh, okay, well, if there's a lesson that I can spread around this world is authenticity is the only thing that you can be. It's all we can do for ourselves. <laughs> the greatest gift you can give yourself. It's, it's so interesting. While our, while our experiences are so different, I absolutely relate also to yours. And it just kind of feels like for all of us men, 
if masculinity or the patriarchy is the bird cage, we're the birds inside of it. We all just want to be set free. And that looks like whatever the hell kind of bird we are, we should be allowed to be. And we yeah. got to be allowed to fly because we're not flying right now. As a mm. collective, we are not. I am personally, but as a collective. <laughs> 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 um, um, so, uh, Matt, you go ahead, jump in, buddy. Yeah, jump yeah. In. So, I, um, you know, it's been a while since I've had human interactions, um, you know, quarantine. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think what Billy's talking about reminds me of a quote by my favorite author, Bell Hooks, an amazing black feminist author, um, uh, writes about feminism, and she talks about men are allegiance to patriarchy as being soul murder. And it's a very strong way of saying it, but um, that is what it felt like for a long time, right? This allegiance, whether it's inside yourself or trying to fit in with other people, um, it is the antithesis of integrity, both with who we authentically are um, and who we want to be in the world, right? When we are silent with other men um, or when we are silent against systems of oppression, as they continue to exist, it is eroding the very fabric of, of our integrity, which is, I think, for me, the spiritual and fundamental basis for who I am as a human being um, is based on that truth and authenticity. So um, what Billy was saying really resonated there. And, you know, I, I want to say, too, like I had the, again, I'm always, you know, me, I, 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 the personal is so important and I always try to bring the systemic in mind as well, you know. Um, I was, I've been in therapy for over half my life. I'm very lucky in that way, very privileged in that way. Uh, there's this one quote that sticks out, you know, rich kids go to therapy, poor kids go to jail. Um, and, you know, as, as my work towards the collective healing as an abolitionist, right, it's about recognizing that, like, you know, particularly, obviously, if under this system for black and brown people that, and particularly poor black and brown folks that, you um, the options to, to share, right? Like the interpersonal option to share may or may not exist depending on the resources available in your community, right? And so I fight for a world, not just in which we feel empowered to share, right? But that there are, that there are resources available, right? Like what is the world we're building where, where school counselors is more popular than school police, right? Where, um, you know, un unhoused people, you know, have resources and homes because, Again, I think so many of these issues, and particularly as a white cis man, right, I need to recognize that, you know, the way that the system treats me, um, I need to be healing myself in the system. But part of the accountability, the loving accountability is like, how do I shift the world so that everyone has the resources, right, um, internally, but also externally, so that when people do express, hey, I'm struggling with this, or instead of being criminalized for mental illness, um, people who don't have that resource can actually have access rather than relying solely on the individual too. You know? hmm. Thank you, Matt. It reminds me of, uh, you brought up bell hooks. Um, and I want to go to Solomon here. You know, there's a quote, another quote from bell hooks. She says that at some point in our lives, every young boy engages in a psychic act of self mutilation where we effectively cut ourselves off from our own feelings. We repress them so deeply because we are so afraid of being and otherized and being called, as Billy said, gay. You can say that. Um, and, and, uh, or, or even a girl, which again, right. Um, so Solomon, I mean, look, you're as an athlete, probably the best athlete, wherever you went, I don't know how tall you are, but I imagine you're pretty, you're a pretty big dude. Um, you, you know, you've, you've probably at some point or another had to engage in that psychic act of cutting yourself off from your feelings. And I'm just wondering um, how you got yourself back from that. Definitely. Um, and as an athlete, it's, it's, it was extremely tough because we're taught mental toughness is to push through something is to, you know, like block out everything and just tell yourself, go, go, go. And I carried that onto my emotional side of my life, but I really only needed that in my physical side of my life because on my emotional side, I need to be in touch with my emotions. I need to feel them. I need to feel my anger. I need to feel my sadness. Those are important. Being angry and sad is more, is just as important as being happy and joyous. Like we, 
in our society, we teach people like you're a burden to someone if you're if you're if you're sad or something. That, that's not true because we all feel these feelings. Like it's so important to be in touch with all of our emotions. And that's why I try to t- try to tell people is that you're feeling your feelings for a reason. So it's important to honor them so you can sort through them so you can be free and be clear with yourself. And so that happened after I started going to therapy when I started realizing, hey, like it's I have so much anger inside of me from losing my sister from the situation that happened. And I need to sort through this anger and it helped me be free. Sorting through my silence helped me be free. And it it took work. It took practice. I'm not perfect at it at all. Like I work on it every day. Um, And uh, I just want to appreciate some things Matt said about how, um, you know, body image issues. As an athlete, I think athletes struggle with body image issues more than people would ever think so. Everything in our job, in our life is about our body. How much we eat or drink, how much we sleep. Every time I, I remember there was times in college and high school, I wouldn't look in the mirror because I was just like, I do all this work. Why am I not looking perfect? Why am I looking like an actor or something like that? Like, and I wouldn't look in the mirror and I would, it, I would just like get sad if I saw myself. And it took me until I was 25. I write down every day in my journal. I said, I love myself unconditionally. No matter what I see in the mirror, I'm like, I love him. Like, I love that. And that took me so long to do, but it's so important to teach that and to understand as men, we can have body image issues and it's important to start sort through them and look through them. And I, I've experienced as an athlete and I know a lot of athletes deal with that and it's not talked about. So I really appreciate you, Matt, saying that. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, yeah. Mm. I, uh, thank you, Solomon. I, I, I relate to that as well. I think, I think it's interesting, you know, when you get men together like this, it doesn't matter how different our experiences are. It seems like we all have this common thread of, uh, of not being allowed to be or feel what we feel and or who we are. Um, so I uh, I want to ask you, Chase, because I know we've had some talks about this and maybe you could each answer this question, but if you could go back in time, what would you say to your younger self? You know, Billy, maybe it's your five-year-old self who's having to go to therapy because your family doesn't like your mannerisms or you know, whatever the age it is, what would you say to yourself? Because I think that that's going to be so important for the young, for the young guys who are watching this. Finally, being able to accept that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. So there's been so many moments in my life, and I'm sure you guys can all relate to this as well, where society tells you, you should be fine, or the moments that you're having great moments and and for whatever reason, and I don't know if it's being a product of divorce or coming from, you know, kind of a, a roller coaster of a childhood with, um, you know, some of the things that I went through as, as a young kid and what I saw that, um, that I, I didn't have to be okay, that I am able to feel my emotions, that I'm allowed to cry if I need to feel like I'm crying. And, and I, I never really understood that. I was always programmed in an environment, Solomon, kind of like you said, I grew up playing sports to where you use your emotions to move you forward through life. Use the negative emotions and and make something out of it. Push yourself into a place that you've never been, whether it's physically or in whatever capacity. And I didn't really understand who I was as a young man till probably the last two to three years where I've, I've been forced to go internally and discover who I am and, and figure that out. So I think at 16, as an angry kid who's trying to understand why now I've dealt with, you know, my my second divorce at a young age, you know, in my family and having to step up as the oldest in a household and, and try to help my mom out in any way possible, that it's okay to be frustrated at the situation, that it's okay to feel angry, that it's okay to not be okay at times. And not every day the sun is going to come out and shine and we're all going to smile and, you know, run into the sunset. It's just we're, we're, we're programmed as men so often to be told to step up that in, in moments of crisis, that it's our job, it's our masculine responsibility to be the man of the household. And I started that at 16. And I wish I could go back and say, it's all right, man, you're never going to be prepared for this. You're never, ever, there's not a, uh, you know, to do book or, or a how to to step up in an environment or how to understand your emotions or how to not be angry at your parents for putting you in a circumstance. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think that's what I tell myself, that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Billy, uh, what would you tell yourself as a young boy? 
Um, I would tell the little boy to, um, try to block out the noise, you know, search for understanding how to block out the noise. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise coming from, from a lot of bullshit things, you know, and if you can just block out the noise, you can see the truth. It's hard to see the truth with the noise. It's hard to feel the truth with the noise. You know, I, I look at these kids today and it's like, this social media thing, I, I don't know what. I mean, it's a whole new level of crazy. You know, it's a whole new level of intensity. Um, just in terms of like what our kids are exposed to and what they have to deal with, what our what as kids, you know, and so I block out the noise, find a way to start with blocking out the noise so that you can hear the truth. I would uh I would tell my young self, um, you know, be authentic and be you, you know. Um, I would tell myself I'm beautifully made the way I am. I'm unique and just be that person. Cause like Billy said, in the social media age of society where all we do is compare or see something, want to grab it. Like, like I will not be happy. I will not be free. I will not be fulfilled unless I live my true self, my true life. And I would tell that, that little kid, I would tell him to hold a smile, hold it strong and love himself to death. Um, because at the end of the day, that is the most important thing. Um, that you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to receive love or feel love if you can't love yourself. So, um, and I just really appreciate what Chase said about it's okay to not be okay. I'll tell myself that too because that's being human. Like to understand that it's okay to not be okay is normalizing mental health and normalizing being human because we're mental health is in, inevitable in all of us. We're all gonna feel all these emotions, whether it's anxiety, depression sadness, anger, awkwardness, whatever it is, we're going to feel these emotions. So we might as well normalize feeling them so we can all sort, sort through them. So we can all talk about them. We can all be vulnerable and grow together and have, have a healthy, healthy, healthy society. So that's what I would tell myself. And yeah, I mean, I just love all the message everyone's saying. I'm, man, I appreciate y'all for real. So thank you. Did I? Mm. Matt? Yeah. Um, a lot of pressure. A lot of, a lot of great things have been said. Uh, been said. Um, you know, I, I think um, I think I would offer myself the the idea that I should center social justice in my life. Um, you know, I, I think that for me, I know that that has been the root of my spirituality, which has sustained me, which has been the bedrock of my. Um, of my ability to feel like I to feel purpose and to feel like that's moving me forward and to understand that through that lens, right? Like trying to win in the ways that I'm told that I should try to win as a man will lead me to an unhealth an unhappy uh, life. Right. And I think even like six years ago when I sort of began activism, I was really, I'd be, I'd won in a lot of the ways, right? I'd won bodybuilding competitions, powerlifting competitions. My career was taking off. I had money, but there was a sense of emptiness there um, because I was trying to win in the way that this society tells me to win. Um, and I wasn't able to really crack that open until I was able to see the different lenses to see how white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and all these things really impacted me. So trying to win in an oppressive system um, as opposed to winning in my own way and, and sort of parsing apart um, my deepest truth. Um, and then, and then moving from there, I think that's, um, that's the message. I probably have to break it down for my 15 year old self, but you know, um, I feel confident I can do it. Well, thank you guys so much, Billy, Solomon, Matt, and Chase. Uh, you are such examples of what it means to me to be man enough and, um, huge thanks to bring change to mine and Glenn close and, uh, people for making this conversation possible. And if you're watching this, um, you know, take Billy's advice and drown out the noise and um, really think about that. And, uh, I just think it's important. There's a lot of noise going on in the world right now. 
look for your voice, right? Look for yourself. And uh, in that, remember that who you are as you are is enough. You don't got to be any more than you already are. You're a bird trapped in a cage and it's time for you to fly. And I appreciate you all for being here and being such examples. God, I wish I had the examples like you growing up. And, uh, and I cannot wait to see this next generation, specifically of young boys and men, grow up to, uh, to challenge the system and, um, and be the best versions of themselves. I appreciate you all. And thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you. Hey guys. Love you all. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zach Williams, and thank you for joining us. I'm a board member of Bring Change to Mind and a mental health advocate. I came to this work after I lost my father. I really struggled with his death. It is so important to talk about mental health and to end stigma. I encourage you to join us in having open and honest conversations about mental health. It can be simple. Ask a family member, friend, or neighbor how they are doing. Listen without judgment. Share your own story and be vulnerable. Everyone can be a part of this movement of change. Let's talk about mental health and save lives. Visit bringchangetomind.org to get involved. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to Conversations with Bring Change to Mind on such an important topic. I'm Dan Wakeford, the Editor-in-Chief of People. Almost all of us know or love someone affected by mental illness or have dealt with it ourselves. Bring Change to Mind and People's Let's Talk About It initiative, which I launched in October 2019, is the perfect partnership because we share a common goal, to destigmatize this sensitive topic, to provide resources about where to get help, and to offer support to help anyone in need. I believe in the power of storytelling, touching people's hearts and opening their minds. I wanted to shape our campaign around stories from regular folks as well as celebrities who have dealt with mental illness. People's Alliance with the Crisis Text Line has also helped hundreds in their time of need. If you or someone you know need mental health help, text STRENGTH to the Crisis Text Line at 741 741 to be connected to a certified crisis counsellor. Just talking about how you feel helps. In other words, saying, let's talk about it, can be a powerful first step to healing.